Can you forgive yourself right now? Can you lay it to rest? Not easily. Somebody has to forgive me. I can't forgive myself in a way. I've got to go and ask the people who suffered whether they'll, they prepare to forgive me. When God made Africa, he had a plan to make it beautiful, a priceless land. At Skritska, where I trained, on the right was the white wards. We white students could traipse all over the show and go and feel a liver or listen to a heart wherever we pleased. The 12% of the students who were not white couldn't go beyond that line in the middle. My dad grew up in South Africa during the apartheid years. Is that you? No, no, no. Now he's going back for his 40-year medical school reunion. I've just finished high school, so he's taking me along. So you know that I used to He wants to show me around, but he also wants to deal with some unfinished business. When God made Africa, how could he know that what he had made could hurt him so? So we'll be there, obviously, for most of the time, but after we finish... With I've always had a good relationship with my dad. Travelling in the car. Might so say I'm his favourite. Well, thanks, Bob. He has a terrible taste in clothes, which we're constantly trying to correct. We managed to get him to buy new glasses a while ago because he had so much for like that. <laughs> he just needs to work on the rest of the ensemble. <laughs> Maybe we just take this out the way. No, that's a bad idea. All right. <laughs> you insist on having it. All right, then just put it in like that. He's very passionate about um, well, being involved in medicine, but bring humanity, bring the arts back to medicine, which I think is fantastic. Merry Christmas to you. Hope you get well soon. Okay. And so he thought he might go to some sort of... Archive. Dad's a professor of psychiatry. The whole He's written quite a few books on mental health and has lectured all over the world. Route, which is called the centrifugal route. She flees the situation. He started off studying medicine at the University of Cape Town. There are about 100 students in his class. 12 of them were classified as non-white under the government's racial laws. I left exactly 24 hours after I graduated as a doctor. I'd been waiting for that day most of my life. Certainly as long as I could sense that apartheid was a, a dreadful thing and something that I couldn't do anything about. There's anger, there's guilt, there's shame. There's definitely something to feel guilty about. It's just how much, what's your responsibility? I never voted for the, the government and I never supported their actions. But just standing by fairly idly must amount to collusion. And collusion, to me, I guess is complicity. When he was my age, Dad was involved in a Jewish youth movement and dreamed of going to Israel. He worked there for a while and that's where he met my mum, Felicity. But she was from Australia, so they ended up living here in Melbourne. We always have an argument about the last bit of the tune. Because yeah. <laughs> we always say... I don't think because I'm Jewish I feel racism more acutely. I think if there's racism or there's intolerance, I feel it because of my humanity. I mean, in a sense, saying because I'm Jewish I feel this more acutely is, is just exacerbates the problem, doesn't it? Growing up Jewish in a racist society was an interesting conundrum. We believed and espoused social justice in terms of our Jewish background, and it was very comforting to have that. But it was a curious admixture because it's okay to be comfortable within, but hang on, that's being oblivious of what's without. 
Here's the reunion, University of Cape Town. It looks like the re-graduation ceremony will be in Jamison Hall. After planning the trip for months, we're almost on our way. But Dad's got a lot on his mind, so it's not exactly going to be a holiday. The question arises as to whether somebody has to give me therapy, such as maybe my old classmates. Maybe uh, I need to ask them um, to forgive me. Maybe I need to apologise. And I have raised the possibility with these former students whether we should have some sort of reconciliation ritual or ceremony in which uh, those of us who were pretty oblivious of their plight should seek their forgiveness. It's completing a process of working through the unresolved feelings that I've had for 40 years. I think spending three weeks together I might quietly go insane. <laughs> Is that Table Mountain? Yes. Oh, yeah. What a lovely Cape Town here. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. What a wonderful world. So this is where you grew up. I didn't live very far from here. To get to these woods was 10 minutes, maybe. And I wouldn't I'm... have minded living here. Well, I don't blame you. Woods. Two metres behind you, your beautiful beach in front of you. That was great. It was really... Did you bring any girls here? No. Oh, I was too shy. Oh, Really shy. Sad. Shy young man I was. My grandparents lived just here, and it definitely didn't have all this electrical wire. And this yeah, is the show that I was a member of, and is now, as you can see, rather different. I cannot believe that this shul is now this commercial space, this gallery. And the Ten Commandments would have been up there. Transformation. <laughs> Unbelievable. Sort of sad, really. 1953, the choir was up there. On the other side of these two buildings, there was a cinema, and that was whites only. And next to the cinema was a post office, and I can recall going up the whites only entrance. I tell you, wherever you went and whatever you did, you had to bear in mind which race you belonged to. So, of course, this place was for whites alone. And I came here day in, day out through the summer. And I must be honest and be truthful, shamefully, that I did not really think for a moment of not coming here as a form of protest. Dad grew up under apartheid, an Afrikaans word meaning apartness or separation. Everyone was classified according to their race and the laws were designed to segregate the races as much as possible. Non-whites could only live in areas set aside for them and they had to carry a pass to be allowed into white areas. They couldn't vote. They couldn't marry whites or have sexual relations with them. They could only have certain unskilled jobs and they were given inferior education. You've just come out of the pool. Mm -hmm. I can remember growing up here. OK. And you would not have been allowed in there unless Definitely. you were a cleaning attendant. Something like that, yes. You are here with your family. It's fantastic to mm -hmm. see it. It's normal. Yeah, definitely. It's bloody abnormal then. Mm -hmm. I would have been angry. Very angry. Like, uh... OK, I never ever liked whites. That was my anger. But now I'm trying just to push it away. Mm. Do, you, do you think the whites are still racist in some ways? Some of them. But we all got that racism in us. You believe we, that? Yeah. Even the colored community, even the blacks still, even the whites, everybody's still, still got a little racism in them. And racism is what we're focusing on today at the Cape Town Holocaust Centre. This is interesting. The display starts with the history of apartheid. The National Party and its apartheid laws 
were strongly supported by the Afrikaans-speaking white minority. Prime Minister Hendrik Favoud led the National Party when Dad was young. And he's the guy who really separates the races. And to me, he was the archetypal Afrikaner Nazi whom I loathed with a passionate intensity. Dad tells me that many of the early Afrikaner leaders, including Favoud, were supporters of the Nazis. This is very important in our family history. Kovno was the capital of Lithuania, and part of our family lived here. Describes its uh, life in Lithuania. Luckily, very rich. my grandparents yes. emigrated from Lithuania to South Africa before World War II. Because when the Nazis occupied Lithuania, Jews were persecuted and forced into ghettos. By the end of the war, 94% of them had been murdered. It's amazing you can see, you know, the similarity between this and before. You've got the Jews loading up their carts to be put into the ghettos and back there in apartheid we can see the blacks being forced into the specific areas with their cars and their wagons. It's based on a similar ideology and made it all the more odious and I suppose all the more conscious that as a Jew, you know, what were we doing about apartheid? But the Jews were, I reckon, feared of doing anything as a community. My parents would say, look, as Jews, we don't, you know, shh, shh. You don't attract attention. And I guess there was an insecurity. After all, they just lost many members of their families, virtually all South African Jewry is Lithuanian, and they'd lost dozens of relatives. In our case, we'd lost 14. So they weren't about to become heroes. I can't forgive Hitler for killing 14 members of my family. Why should I forgive Favut? Ever since I can remember, as a kid even, Afrikaner-dom to me was like Nazism. And many of the Afrikaners sympathized with the Nazis. So anyway, they to me are the enemy, they always were, and they, it hasn't changed to this day, because I've never spoken with them in any sort of way other than, you know, can you mind the way I've got to go through the door? I mean, it's just functional language like you that. You lived your whole life up to 24 and yet you never mixed. Well, there were some Afrikaners in my class, but I had almost nothing to do with them. So, for all Dad's talk about hating racism, he's a bit prejudiced himself. This is a beautiful town hall. I used to come down here to hear the Cape Town Musical <coughs> Orchestra. The thing that really gets me now is not the music, it's the rope that went from that cook end to this end, around about behind us, uh. about two rows behind. And the non-whites behind the rope, thank you very much. The rest, whites only. One more element of just going, going along with the system. At, to suit my convenience and because didn't didn't think twice and uh, this is what uh, really bugs me a lot ladies uh oh dad's off talking to strangers again you know that in this place they had a rope down the down the back here because in those days you could only sit behind the rope i could sit anywhere i wanted you understand <laughs> the rope <laughs> the rope the rope era the apartheid era, yes. what are your feelings about yes. that? Yes, I was angry, mm -hmm. angry all the time, especially at white people, yes. Me? Yes, I said, hey, white people, men, they're cruel, all of them. Mm. Do you um, <laughs> still have the anger in you, or do you think it's now in the background? Not anymore, not anymore. It's past history? Yeah. Do you believe in forgiveness? Yes. Because I'm a Christian now. Yeah. But if I was not a Christian, I don't think that it will be easy for me. Yeah, I find it, personally, I find yeah, that really yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah, to... because now they, the church, they teach us a lot about forgiveness. Yeah. If you cannot forgive, then I'm also a sinner. I do a lot of things. How can God forgive me? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I have to forgive. No matter how hard it is, I have to forgive. But you cannot forgive for one day. It takes time. Mm. But at the end, it gets finished. What did you think of the people like him who didn't, they weren't for the system, but then they didn't really do anything against it. No, it's not right. Mm. You have to stand for what you believe, you have to fight for it. Yeah. When Dad was 15, he did try to stand up for what he believed in. 
It was on the day they enforced segregation on Cape Town buses. I hop on the bus, it's mid-afternoon, and there's a sign saying, front of this X, whites only. And I sat in the wrong side of the bus, which was designated for blacks only. The conductor approaches me and says, you know about the new regulations? As you can see very clearly, you are sitting on the wrong side of the bus. Could you please move up here to the right side of the bus? And I said, no, I uh, think I'm very comfortable here. Thank you very much. He says, don't make my job difficult, man. I didn't, in didn't invent these laws. I didn't create these laws. You move, otherwise there's going to be trouble. And I know full well that in this very vicinity is the main police station of Cape Town. The trolley car stops, like here. And he says, OK, we have only two choices. Either you move or we pay a visit to the station. And I guess why it's remained a crucial day for me to this day is that for reasons which I'm not clear about, I moved. Do you ever wonder what if you'd made the other decision? What? I've always felt that. And what do you feel? Well, what happened? if? Um, if I'd gone in and, shall we say, branded myself as a, an opponent, a resistor, it may have been the beginning of further resistance. The following day, I got onto an apartheid bus and and the day after that, and until I left the country, what, eight years later or whatever. So I fell into the racist system without any great degree of trouble. Well, was it your struggle, and should, should you feel guilty about not taking part in something that had nothing to do I with you? I don't feel guilty, but I didn't do what I should have done whilst I was here. What could you have done while you were here? Well, I could have done what LB Sachs did, and he went the full road. Do you really he? think you could have made a difference? Full journey. Well, he did. He helped to topple apartheid, didn't he? Welcome. Great to meet you and see you and know you, etc., etc. And Aaron, my son. Hi. The future. Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah. Aaron. Albie Sachs is a bit of a hero to my dad. His family was also Jewish, and he also grew up in Cape Town. But as a teenager, Albie did join the struggle against apartheid. When his car was bombed by South African security forces, he lost an arm and the sight of one eye. I think the critical thing was there wasn't a heroic moment. You stand up in the trenches and you say uh, victory or death and you charge. It, it wasn't like that at all. It was a series of little encounters. I had taken part in the Defiance of Unjust Laws campaign when nearly 10,000 black people walked onto bridges marked whites only, sat down on benches marked whites only. Just four of us in Cape Town sat down on benches marked non-whites only. And we were arrested. And I shouted, my boy, Africa, Africa, come back. I mean, I'm frightened now when I think of a 17-year-old kid in front of the cops uh, giving the, the freedom signal and shouting out in that way. But when I got to court, the magistrate saw I was 17, a juvenile, and he said, is your mother in court? And my mother stood up and said, yes, I'm sending you home to your mother. <laughs> and uh, there are not many revolutionaries have been sent home uh, to the <laughs> Maybe your mother can talk sense into your way. <laughs> it's just so much a parallel. When I was 15, they introduced uh, bus apartheid in Cape Town, and on the first day, I sat on the wrong side of the bus and uh, the conductor stopped the bus outside Calderton Street Police Station, and I moved. And I must say, I regret this to this day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a little gesture like that, it wouldn't have changed very much. You, you, you've got to work with others. It's got to be concerted, so it's not enough just to make your place. I was on my own, too. But I that's think. important for you, and for each individual, these yes. gestures do count. Albie told us how things changed in March 1960. At Sharpville, near Johannesburg, police fired on an unarmed crowd of protesters and killed 69 people. After Sharpville, the government banned most political organisations. Opposing the apartheid laws was dangerous, 
because people in prison were often tortured and killed. Like many others, Albie Sachs was jailed without trial under the 90-day detention laws. The very worst moments for me were when I was in solitary confinement, not knowing how long it's going to last, no one to speak to, nothing to do, no activity, just rotting during the day, singing to have a sense of myself. I'll be living here always, year after year always, in this little cell that I know so well. I'll be living swell always, always, not for but an hour, not for but a week, not for 90 days, <laughs> but always. How did you keep going? How did you find hope to continue the struggle? It wasn't hope. It was an absolute certainty and clarity. Apartheid was wrong, racism was wrong, the way they were defending the country was wrong. That was never, never in doubt. And we were the majority and the world was on our side and eventually there would be victory. Do you feel the Jewish community should have taken more of a prominent role in the struggle? No. I wouldn't say Jews have a greater responsibility than anybody else to be anti-racist. Everybody has a responsibility to be anti-racist. Uh, it's just, it saddens one perhaps a bit more when people who belong to community historically that suffered so much manifest the, the same intolerance uh, to which their grandparents were, were subjected. But that's more a sadness than an anger. What would you have done? You've been in this country now a while. I would have left and I wouldn't have looked back. Right. Why? As much as there are people suffering around you and as much as it hurts you to see that, I just don't feel that there's really anything... I feel that my life is more important to be lived for me. I don't know how selfish that view is, but... That's extraordinarily selfish. I don't want to give my life away. You mean doing... Hypothetically... Doing an LB sex? Yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Essentially, there's, there's always it comes down to this. There's a responsibility to yourself, and there's a responsibility to your state. And it's in conflict sometimes, and you've got to choose what's more important. There's a responsibility to be a member of the human community, trite as that may sound. Forget about the state. I don't I want was... you to lecture me about being a member of the human community, though, when you didn't. You left. You did the exact same thing I'm saying I'm not... I did. The only difference is I'm, I'm having the courage to come out and say I would have done that, not said, oh, I should have done this, and I should have been Alvy Sachs, and I should have done this. We're not all heroes. And perhaps yeah. it takes, perhaps what you have, what you need to discover on this trip is the courage to say that I am not a hero and I couldn't have been. Well, I never. And perhaps there's nothing wrong I with that. I never claimed to be a hero, never have thought of myself why are you as here? heroic. The whole, the whole thing you're, you're basing this is on is the wrong side of the bus. That was the, the point of your, of your protest, your conflict. And that's where you, you know, you failed. I uh, failed in certain respects in that on a day-to-day -day level, this is the most crucial thing I feel, on a day-to-day -day level I let people down. We, we had supposedly a multiracial class for six years, it's a long time, and I let them down. And that's why you're here. With the reunion still a few days away, Dad decides to do something about his reconciliation idea. So he's off to get advice from the University of Cape Town's Transformation Office. Part of their job is to deal with past injustices on the campus. We had a class of 100, of whom 12 were uh, Malay, Indian, um, coloured, um, and one Chinese student. And I have to say that we did not appreciate what they were going through. In the forthcoming reunion, I'm proposing that we should have a reconciliation ceremony. So any thoughts about what form it might take? Well, I'm just thinking aloud. I yeah. think um, initiating a conversation is one way of engaging people yeah. and make it as informal as is possible because by definition, it's a hard topic is, to, yeah. to talk about. You may be taking people back to where they would rather not go. But do you think 
It should be an apology or an acknowledgement. I mean, what? Acknowledgement, What's, rather. That's what. Acknowledgement. That's what I think. You don't like the word apologize? But it was a system, so I don't think it's okay for people to actually take individual responsibility to say, I'm yeah. sorry, as if it yeah. was of their own creation. Yes. But people had choices to actually yeah. oppose or yeah. oblige what yeah. people... Yeah, it was a system, but we as a group, as a class, could have said, we're not going to pay Morton's unless everybody is allowed to Everybody's go allowed to go. Yeah, or we're yeah. not working in this ward unless... Um, all members of the class. So we didn't do that. I'm interested in, you know, doing something at this rather symbolic point 40 years on. It's more important to make it about how we all feel about the, those days and being very open with each other. No, I'm just saying this is an idea. I'm not saying this is to be done. I'm just saying this is where the, the thinking is going. The only worry, I suppose, that you've got is that a small group represents apathy. For me, a small group represents a group of people who have a need to come together and want to do something. You want to let sleeping dogs lie. I'm not sure what you're saying, Erin. I can't do it on my own, can I? I, mean, please. I can't come in and just say, oh, I certainly block ex demand the following. People Finally, two old there. classmates agree to meet Dad to discuss his reconciliation idea in person. Yep. Be in touch. Thanks very much indeed. Cheers. Phew, this is quite tiring. But meanwhile, there's someone special he wants me to meet in one of the townships. Beauty, what are you doing with a stick? You're not allowed to have a stick. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> How old are you? I'm old. I'm old. I'm old. I'm old. Very, very the old. The most important woman <laughs> in the world for my mother. Oh. Erin, this is Hi. this is Beauty. Nice to meet you. In Gaza. <laughs> Beauty looked after my mum for 16 months. Yes. About that. Yes, about you. When she was not so well. <laughs> one of them is me. This one? Yeah, that's me. Oh, I miss your grandmother a lot. Mm. I always dream of her. Yeah. Because she was very close to me. Yes. Very, well, very close and, to me. Um, she loved you very much. Mm. I love him too. Mm. I loved her too. Yeah. Because he was part of my family. Yeah. Yes. She was very, very la la nice to me. He did everything for me. I mean, love. He gave me proper love. Yeah. Yes. We always cry for the apartheid business that fell on us in South Africa. You cry? It was like a rain, the way it was pouring to us. They didn't promote us because we were black. Never mind what standard you pass at school, then you don't still crawling under the people, didn't pass anything. You teach them how to, to, to do the work, then you still under them. And the, the payment was poor, very poor. Yeah. That's why we're still so poor, even now. Yeah. That's why we say thank you, Matiba, yep. Nelson Mandela. We were thankful to him, you know, because he said he's, 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 he's brought sense into us. He's got a, 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 a sense of, of forgiveness. Yeah. You're very generous people. I do forgive, but I can never forget yes. what had happened to us. You see, I'm Jewish, and a lot of my family were killed in the Second World War, right? So I find it very difficult to forgive. I don't know, you know, that's just, as I said, the Nazis, they were evil and so on. And I say the same thing about Favut in the Africa. I can't forgive a person like that. So, if you forgive, you maybe you're much stronger than I am, you know, to do that. This country needs to be built. Mm. This country has been destroyed. If we go on hating, taking our country, taking it down to the gutters, mm. what will happen to these children? Yeah. And I will invite you, come and stay in Africa again. Then you'll forget about Haiti. <laughs> Part of me thinks uh, they're all in denial. 
they don't recognize that you can't just put your history behind you. It's just not conceivable to me. It sort of shows a bit of feebleness of spirit for you to be sort of tossing and turning for 40 years when you really experience nothing of the of the harshness of this that, that, that these other people went through and you still can't move on when these other people are living in as their day-to-day -day lives. Perpetrator, we've, but we've not forgotten. Good question. <laughs> Perpetrator, bystander, victim. Sometimes it's damned if to know what you are. But I, I think I am a bystander like most people and that's probably not a great position to be in. I'm still in it. Otherwise, I don't suppose I'd be coming to this country right now in the way I am. Dad's attending a workshop at the Holocaust Centre called Facing the Past. The idea is to confront your own personal experience of racism and examine your role as victim, perpetrator or bystander. The leader of the workshop is Temba Lonzi. But when God made Africa, did he foresee people with empty hands such misery? After apartheid ended, South Africa had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So South Africans are familiar with the process of facing the past. But for Dad, this is all new ground. I will share with you now my story of being born in apartheid South Africa. It's a story which is about what was done to me, what I did to others, and what I failed to do. I was filled with hatred. I hated white people and I had the desire for revenge. Another experience of apartheid that I'm having is just embedded in my education. If you, you, you say bad things about maybe white people or whatever, you'll see that the police will come. We were not allowed to shape our own thinking. We were not allowed to make choices because choices were made for us. I'm one of those who did nothing. I actually believe that in the end I couldn't do a thing here because I felt quite helpless, hopeless, and morally devastated. What are the things that are going to destroy us that we have from the past that we need to leave behind? And what are the things that are life-giving that we can take from our past? All the answers won't come now, but we need to grapple, we need to struggle with these answers. <laughs> We need to find one another and, and be able to, to see each other as human beings. There were no issues in my head, it was simply that sense of belonging, which was a wonderful feeling. <laughs> um. Tears of joy and tears of grief all blended. Uh, joy because to be in, in 23 years of living here, a man like Tembo, who had never entered my life, they were just Africans, natives, blacks. And having the other blacks and colors and all the racial groups together is a source of great joy and grief because why did it happen in 23 years of living here? I've come with Dad to the District 6 Museum to meet his old classmates, Erwin and Ronnie. Dr. Bloch, I presume. <laughs> I saw you, Ben. Did it look like you? Yes. You've aged, you man. Know. You've aged something terrible, man. I don't think so. No, no, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the one who's aged. You've definitely aged. lost a bit of hair, though. I definitely a lot of hair. How are you? I'm 
Excellent. One of my offspring. Erron. Ronnie, my oldest mate. How's the trip going so far? Yeah, it's good. And it's besides good. your crazy father. Well, it's all my crazy father. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my friend. Erwin. Nice to see you. It's been 40 years, my friend. You years. haven't met him 40 years? I haven't seen we you haven't. for 40 we years. Haven't. I can't believe it. Yeah. No. That's we a long haven't. time. He's What's got a big problem, this guy. I think what he needs is some psychotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> While they catch up, I take a look around the museum. District 6 was one of the few mixed-race areas in Cape Town and included many Jews. 60,000 coloured people also once lived in this thriving community. But in 1966, the government declared it for whites only. The coloureds were forcibly removed and their houses flattened. So it's an appropriate place for them to discuss the apartheid days. You remember, we couldn't go in and, and see a, a white post-mortem. Yeah. You know that. I had forgotten. Uh, we could not. Well, I discovered it. We were excluded. It, yeah, I discovered it only in October of third year. We were not I, allowed to dissect white bodies. As, as we are talking, I'm beginning to remember, like when we'd go up on rounds, you know, that in fact my non-white classmates weren't permitted into the white wards. Mm. Um, I remember that. Why didn't we do something about it? Once sensed that you were not happy. This I sense well, this from your behavior. Yeah. And yet at the same time, you ask yourself, well, if this is the way you felt at the time, why didn't you open your mouth? OK, and that's what I'd and like why to... Why didn't you open your mouth? Why didn't we open our mouths to the extent of saying, look, if Erwin can't go to these post we won't go I ain't either. going either. Right. And that's exactly. all you needed to do. Right. And I regret to this day, 40 years later, that I didn't do that, 43 years later. I think it's inexcusable. As I sit this here is, now... This is why I, I think reconciliation... No, is I necessary. understand what you're saying now. I mean, I understand it a little bit better. I, too, wish I would have done that, Sydney. Yeah. I, as I'm sitting... I don't, I don't have a memory of it, you see. It hasn't been eating away at me at the... As I sit here now, I'm embarrassed to think that I didn't do that. Well, I, I, and, uh, I'm, a, I'm actually ashamed. Yeah. What astounded me always, that where you expected protest against the... Uh, situation that we were in at the time. People like many of my Jewish friends decided to keep quiet, mm. play safe. And, uh, and this is something that one always reflected on. Mm. I grew up with Jews and we mm. were friends, we played together, we slept together and so on and so on. And then eventually you come across a situation, you know, where they become white. In, in, in the political sense, yeah. you yes. see. We were wrong. We were wrong back then, Erwin. What is it, what is needed today, if anything? It, it's a dismal past. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I don't think you don't look happy with that past at no. all. No. But uh, it's history. No, well, well hang on. The question, but but so it's ongoing history. It's as alive this minute as we talk as it was 43 years ago. For me, for me yeah. For me. yeah. That's why I have to reconcile. No, I no, have. No, no, no. Hang on a minute. I'm Hold it a minute. All right. <laughs> you have to reconcile. I have to. I said. But it doesn't mean that everybody no, else. No, I said I. I said in, in your mind, a conversation of this nature that would involve 30 people, 20 people, whatever number, 10 people. Oh. Do you see that as something worth pursuing? It would be interesting. It would be very interesting. <laughs> this is the objective scientist. It would be to... very interesting. Mm. If you say it would be very interesting, I'm willing to play a part in it. It's finally the weekend of the reunion, so I'm letting Dad get on with it. You've retired, have you? Uh, five years from it. Welcome to Bell Good to see you. He's been looking forward to the ceremony today when he and his classmates are re-awarded their degrees. The reconciliation session is tomorrow, but he's worried that not many people will show up. If you can you know, 
if you've got buddies who are here and you feel you can gain their confidence, you just mention that we're having this conversation, but nobody can be forced to come, and if, when they come, they don't have to do any talking either. They might just want to listen in to what's going on. I will now receive the graduates and the diplomates presented to me. Sidney Bloch, PhD, FRC Psych, Diploma in Philosophy and Medicine. Professor of Psychiatry, University of Melbourne, editor of the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry for the past 13 years. He has a passion for choral singing and bushwalking. Well, friends, the Vice Chancellor referred to a process of healing a few minutes ago. A few of us got together earlier this week and we chatted about this and about what we're doing here. And we came up with the idea that tomorrow afternoon we would have what uh, we're calling a conversation. The free and open chat, things happen in those days, we all know about them and I guess for some of us they haven't perhaps been ventilated and I just very much hope uh, we'll all meet together in this conversation tomorrow around one o'clock. Thanks very much indeed. As people show up for Dad's reconciliation session, he's still anxious about how it'll go. At least Irwin, Ronnie and a few others have come. I had always been conscious of the fact that among the 108 students or whatever number, there were 12 who were there by special licence, I'm told. But um, as we all know, you guys, and there are a few representatives of you here today, were discriminated against in a most shocking way. I didn't feel as slighted during the course of my stay at this university as I sat and watched those party pictures that were shown today. Mm. It really hit me that there was not a single black face over there. Mm. This made me realize how much outside mm. the situation we were. Those students who were not classified white were made to understand that they were non-white and not really part of the general group. But uh, we did not feel humiliated, and this is something that I want to say here. We did not feel humiliated. I think, if anything, we looked upon this majority as behaving in a very stupid sort of way. We are going towards a situation eventually which is going to be real democracy. Don't they realize this? And this was our attitude. I just want to point out that exclusion was not a matter of color. Exclusion was often about many other things. Yes. And I felt excluded because I belonged to a language group called Afrikaans, which was in a distinct minority, even less than the 12 colored people that we had in our medical school. OK? So please, Irwin, I really am sad to hear, and I feel almost hurt by your words, because certainly none of what you said was any of my emotions that I felt over the six years. I actually tried to actually try and break down barriers. You were an exception, Ed. That, that might be sad, mm -hmm. but I really did, but I still felt that you couldn't get into, with all due respect, into a Jewish group. They would sit in the union by themselves. The colored people would sit in the union by themselves. If you joined them, the conversation just stopped. Okay? I never got into the Jewish group. Yeah. I was Jewish. I never got into the Jewish group. Yeah. Believe me, as a non-Jewish, I had even less job. We've all got a story to tell. We've all been through a process of change and development and transformation. And for me, that's more important to go away with something really positive of what's going on now than to be indulging with tears okay. about the past. Okay. What can we as a group yes. who, who owe our education to this place do to not to squander the opportunity we have to come back to a so-called non-racial country, to a so-called unified country, how can we help? People can come out here for their three-month holidays or whatever. We can teach medical students. We can act as role models. And we had a very solid discussion about where we might go with this and do things. And so 
doing something on behalf of the class of 64 is a reality which is really a great source of satisfaction. Did any colored or blacks come? Two. It was only partially... And do you feel reconciled? Not really, because not many people in the end showed up to it. One of our friends said, oh, look, it's all about Jewish angst, because there were quite a few Jews there. I think he might have had a point. So the reconciliation attempt still hasn't resolved much for Dad. But here at Rutuskur Hospital, he decides to come face to face with his own prejudice. When I heard you talk in the conversation session yesterday, I was absolutely stunned. I've never spoken about this. What, throughout all these years? Yes. Really? Yeah. I um, did not reach out to you or to any other Afrikaner in the class, or to any Afrikaner anywhere, ever. I have to strip off all the crap and, and be honest mm. with you yeah. and say, you were the enemy. I suppose, you know, I could say to a large extent that I was surprised at some of your statements. The idea that uh, the Afrikaner was someone to be uh, sort of put into one category was making exactly the same mistakes that we all make. Putting Jews into one category, putting Germans into one category. But certainly I don't think I ever consciously would ever have been part or ever was part of condoning or agreeing with any discriminatory sort of practices. But doing anything that was active during those times would have been a very strange thing for me and counter to my culture, to the way I was brought up, to my respect for the law, even if it was bad. But I felt that many people who were far more vocal uh, opponents of the system as the had the opportunity disappeared out of South Africa and made no contribution to the change that happened in South Africa and you know that once again I, I, you know I'm not blaming you or I'm not saying that you should have stayed that's an individual decision which each one has to make but I was one of the people who stayed and tried to make the whole thing work and I think that, that, that in the end to me is the important thing. This is what propelled me to organise this session because I feel that we are well intentioned, we have the right spirits, mm. but we haven't had the chance to talk. And it's a great breakthrough for me. I feel I want to give you a hug. Is that permissible? That's permissible. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, it's something that's very healing of yeah. some personal contact. Absolutely. Now this has been great and I thank you very much for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Sydney. Cheers. He's not for Woods, who was the archetypal tyrant of apartheid. He's Ed could see. And it's a huge difference and it's a big learning experience for me. One of the best learning experiences I've had on this trip. abandon the country and you abandon your moral and you in a sense you know you it was a massive blow to, to what you stood for and now we're coming back here and will you be able to accept that will you be able to forgive yourself for doing that it's not easily forgivable somebody has to forgive me I can't forgive myself in a way I've got to go and ask the people who suffered whether they'll they prepare to forgive me dad's still hanging on to his guilt I can't shift him and it's the last day of our journey. But do you feel that you're worthy of their forgiveness? We're on the notorious Robben Island off the coast of Cape Town. This is where Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners were kept in appalling conditions. Are you the guide or the organiser or the, no, the guide. or the chairman of the board? Or you? I wish I was. Well, we could promote you. I'm putting a good word for you. Our guide is Modisa Fekonyane. Dad tells him his story and why he's returned to South Africa. The old and the new. Then Modisa tells us his story. It turns out that he was a political prisoner here. Modisa was just 17 when he was arrested. 
But unlike Albie Sachs, he wasn't sent home to his mother. This was my home uh, for a period of five years. This is where I lived. Would you guys like to come through? We were beaten into complete submission. There was a lot of suffering here. One guy that I know was buried up to the neck level, demanded his freedom. They gathered around him, prison guards kicked his head, mocked him. They kicked, beat him up so bad to the point he permanently lost an eye. This suffering was all about the future of South Africa. Nelson Mandela himself rose from the ashes and dust of this quarry, led by example to forgive. This was a home of Mr. Nelson Mandela for a period of 18 years. Coming here to pay homage, to come to terms with yourself. It's not a sense of guilt. You disassociated with the evil. You have come to associate with the positive and to embrace the future. Much as this key in the past represented my pain, it represents my future today. It's a symbol of hope for our country. We unlock possibilities. I just want to present you the opportunity. Very good, very poetic, very lovely. To good open way. this key, yep. this door of Mr. Mandela, where he lived for 18 years. Okay. And open the future prospects in your life. Yep. Okay. I have been able to forgive. At some point, it's something that you had to make up your mind, you have to do, to forgive. Forgive those who tortured, who brutalized, almost close to the point of death. It was painful, it was hard, it was very difficult. I gave myself a chance when I chose to forgive, to heal. The opposite of that is that you are consumed inside. Emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically. Just more personally, can you forgive me for doing what they call the chicken run Absolutely. when I was 23? Absolutely. And my forgiveness to you is not conditional. The mere fact that you have come home and said, I was wrong by walking away, that in itself is enough. I have no right to judge you. I have no right to condemn you. I have no right to make you feel guilty the rest of your life. Your children, they are children's children, your grand-grandchildren, would have no reason to condemn you for being inactive. They would respect you for the guts you had to come back and face your past and deal with it once and for all. It's very generous of you, Bodhisa. I, don't know. I, um, I thank you for that. I don't know if it's deserved. In the I mean, well, guts, I think, the guts are, you know, it sounds a little think, too good for me. I think <laughs> we've come to that point. I what? think right here, we're sitting on Robben Island, it's 40 years later, you've come to confront your past, mm. you're facing your past now. We've come to the point that Madisa talked about, that point where you make your decision. Mm. You totally messed up in the past. You yeah. neglected your responsibility, you walked away from this situation. But now you have come back and you realize things have changed and you were not part of the change. Mm. But you want to be part of the future and that's the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Oh, God of Africa, you have made our land. So give us wisdom to understand. I've gone on a journey from being incredibly cynical um, to, I guess, my hope, my, you know, my belief in humanity is affirmed. I've gone from going, look, I don't care, it's not my problem. I would have gone to the other side of the bus and I would have walked off and I would have forgotten about it. But I feel like now, if I was put to the test, I would like to think that I would be on that side of the bus, the wrong side of the bus. 
When God made Africa, how could he know that what he had made could hurt him so? Open our eyes to see behind the face to the human being inside. In spite of the race, to the human being inside. In spite of the race, to the human being inside. In spite of the race. I love you, Africa.